segment we talked about game tie about three and a half minutes ago in one minute and 10 seconds 8-0 run denver gets the separation denver gets the win same two teams tonight we're going to talk about that right now with our next guest as all guests come to you from the Folsom lake honda hotline Folsom lake honda your one-stop honda shop king's television analyst katie christensen joins us every wednesday at eight o'clock katie good morning how are you Good morning. How are you, Jay Ross? I'm doing well. Trying to, uh, you know, take in that really the home stand. I mean, I think last night there was there was some good stuff by the Sacramento Kings. I'm still bummed by the the Wizards and Hornets performance, but you know, the first look at the Kings without Demontis Sabonis is not going to be easy. But I thought there were some some good things they did there. What what do you think they missed the most last night without Domas? Well, I think just the pressure that he puts on defenses and whether it's at the rim or on the elbow and he has the ability to stretch the floor. He's shooting a really good clip from three this year and he's selective about it. Um, But, you know, I I was, it was a refreshing thing to see how well they kind of adjusted in, in face of adversity. You know, I think that multiple people stepped up that small ball lineup with Trey Lyles at the five, I thought was really effective for stretches in that game. And, You know, when you've got someone that, you know, rebounds the way that Domas does and assists and and scores, like you need multiple people to kind of fill that hole. And I thought the really positive thing that came out of it is that a lot of people stepped up and performed well. And I thought Alex Lynn did a really, really solid job in his time. And, you know, he has not played in quite some time. And I said it on the broadcast, there's a big difference between, you know, conditioning and running line drills to to actually playing game minutes. And, you know, he was sick for a while and he's lost some weight, but I thought that he stepped up and did a really, really solid job. Yeah. And the first game you're asked to is also to play against the Joker, who I think Katie for, for a good chunk of it, I thought the Kings had had a really good game plan involved. I know Denver's the top three point shooting team and they were missing shots, but as the game went along, where where did the I don't even know if it's slippage, but it just felt like Denver got to the players that they wanted to control the game more in Porter, Murray, and Jokic. Did was that more credit to Denver or or some slippage on defense by the Kings? I mean, when you look at the fact that, you know, uh Nicola had two points at halftime. He had, you know, two shots that he took. It it was I knew uh, and I wrote it on my little halftime box score that I tweet out every game that You know, I circled it and I was like, this is going to change in the second half. And he really came out and had a big third quarter. So, you know, it's, it's difficult when you're guarding him, right? If you let him catch the ball deep, then he demands a double team. And they kept getting that backdoor cut along the baseline um, for an open, an open dunk or layup. And I wouldn't call it slippage necessarily. You know, I, I think this is the same problem that every team that faces Denver, you know, has to deal with in terms of how Nicola affects the game in so many ways. The similarities between him and Domas are, you know, it's it they're they're the same type of center, and there's not there's two of them in the league. No one else plays the way that those two do. Um, so I, I'm hesitant really to say that it was slippage. There was some errors. There were some turnovers. Um, kind of down the stretch where they had done a pretty decent job. And I'm trying to remember if it was the fourth or the third quarter where there was, I think it was the fourth where they had like, you know, four or five turnovers that really hurt them and allowed a run by Denver. So, you know, it's yes, in part some slippage by them, um, but you, you have to kind of credit Denver. They're the number one team in the Western conference for a reason. And they're finally healthy this year. And I think that Michael Porter Jr., you know, his three-point shooting really changed the game. And, yeah, they're the best three-point shooting team in the league, but they also take the fewest. They Mm -hmm. take 30 a game. Um, But now that you've got Michael Porter Jr. back, and he is such a a threat from beyond the arc, he really, really is, is kind of changing things offensively for them when he's able to shoot the ball like that. One of the mysteries of the game to me was, and you brought it up perfectly earlier, about the pressure Sabonis brings to the opposing team. I think he is probably responsible for five to seven fast breaks on his own where he clears the boards and just pushes it and and creates just stress on the defense. Just two fast break points last night, Katie, and that's with Fox, that's with Mitchell, some of these monks, some quick guards. Why do you think they didn't get the numbers there, even while Denver was missing all those shots early? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. I, I Sometimes fast break points kind of mystify me. Like, how do you, how do they quantify those? Because mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember what game it was on this last road trip 
where they hadn't forced a single turnover in the first half, but they had like 12 fast break points. Yeah. Right. Um, and so it's like, all right, it's a, that's off of missed shots um, sometimes. But, you know, the Kings really do an excellent job. I think they're one of the best teams in the league at running off of makes as well. But I think you kind of nailed it, right? Like when DeMontis is able to clear the boards, bring the ball up the floor, it changes how defenses have to, you know, guard. Um, and it makes it, it opens up the, the rim a little bit for those opportunities. But, you know, I, that's the, the one thing that it's really hard to replace 15 boards a game, right? And those fast break points. And I, I actually felt like collectively the group did a really good job of rebounding in his absence. But if they can figure out tonight some way to manufacture some fast break points and put a little bit more pressure on that defense and transition, I think that that's going to be a really big key. A lot of times the way this league works, you may not face another team for, you know, week, two weeks, a month later. This is unique. You play in the very next night. Feels like a little mini yeah. playoff series. So the Kings were the team that lost. You feel like they have to adjust a little bit more. What kind of tweaks do you think? Jordy Fernandez, you know, Mike Brown, of course, too, is still, you know, overseeing things will have as far as adjustments for tonight. I think the really big key is how do you defend in the situations where Jokic gets the ball on the low block deep? And, you know, I, I talked about it on the broadcast last night. When you're playing a really dominant, like, low post player like Jokic, one of the keys to mm, – neutralizing him a little bit. There's no stopping him, right? But you can kind of neutralize some of the damage that he does is to really make sure that they don't get that deep position. And so if they can get him, you know, meet him about the free throw line, the elbow area, and kind of push him off that low block, I thought Trey Wiles actually did a really good job of that um, when he came in in those late minutes. And, you know, then you make him a, a mid-range shooter instead of a facilitator or a scorer, you know, within the five foot range. But to me, they have to figure out when they double team him, how are they going to guard, you know, the second line of defense, who's going to go and get, you know, the guy that is cutting to the basket, because I would rather them take away that, you know, cut to the basket and leave an open shooter across the floor and then just try and play, you know, scramble defense than for them to get, the amount of, of buckets that they did just right at the rim because of double teaming. Katie, we don't know when Sabonis will play. There's some thought it might even be tonight. We don't know, and he's going to try to play through some discomfort. We, ne we know that it's rare that anybody ever feels 100%, but literally when there's an injury and having to play through it, how much of a challenge will that be for Sabonis, who's so important to everything the Kings do? Yeah, you know, Jason, I'm a little, like, um, unclear on what exactly is going on, right? Um, he had the compression, it looked like a compression glove on his on his hand, and obviously, you know, I'm not a doctor, but my assumption with that is just you're trying to compress that ligament um, and, and put pressure on it so that it, from how I understand it, it's detached from the bone. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I'm not really clear on that, and I'm also not really clear on the time frame, right? It's like a day-to-day -day thing. Um, what, what is the amount of time, you know, until it's, it's healed, you know, we forget Keegan Murray is also playing through a similar thing on his non-shooting hand, um, which is, is a little strange. I know you, I'm sure people have noticed that his, um, let's see, it's his off hand and he shoots right. So it's his left hand, even though he writes left-handed. That's the thing. It's, yeah. I gotta always remember with him. He's left-handed, but he shoots right-handed. So it's on his left hand, and he's been playing with that tape, and it's a very similar thing. And then he wears kind of a removable cast when he's not playing. So, you know, I, I think in this situation, it's really up to the medical staff deciding, you know, if it's safe for him to play, and then second for Sabonis to decide if the pain that he's dealing with, he can play with as long as it's safe. So I'm really kind of waiting like everyone else, Jason, to see what the time frame for this injury is. Yeah, because, I mean, again, I'm reading stuff not just based on other NBA guys that have done it that actually underwent surgery. Some of the talk yeah. has been seven to eight weeks. Now, others have played through it. Now, I'm trying to think, for your career, what, what's the most, what was the most difficult injury that you actually still took the court and played with? 
Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, ankle sprains are a very common yeah. thing. And once you really kind of have a severe ankle sprain, um, you'll roll them constantly, but you kind of ripped everything up so that the amount of damage, it doesn't really matter. But for me personally, like I, my career ended with a back injury. And I actually injured my back my very first year in the league. And, you know, it's six years of playing through that and managing it with, you know, making sure I, I couldn't, it got to the point where I couldn't participate in double days. Um, traveling was a really difficult thing. You know, I always had to wear like a tens unit on my back the entire time we were traveling. And by the time it kind of came to the end, I mean, it's like you play through it to the degree where you're, you, it's like you can't support it anymore. And I was like on bed rest for two weeks. I couldn't get out of bed. And so everyone deals with their own, you know, things, but you know, the finger injuries, it's like, okay, it's strange because they might be, you know, quote unquote minor, but the, you, you make contact every single possession and it's just pain every single possession that you're playing. So as long as it's not something that can do further harm, and you can tape it, whatever, and you can manage kind of the discomfort, then it's really up to the, to the player. Hmm. Last thing for you, Katie. I mean, again, it's unique. The Kings are going to have more of these coming up to these little schedule pods where they have the same team either back to back or twice in a three day stretch as a player. Do you, is this, do you like that? Or do you like the variety of kind of jumping around? <laughs> Hold on one second. Oh, JJ, one second. Sorry, we're oh. doing breakfast right now. I stepped outside. She found me. Um, you know, I'm not a fan of the the back to back games um, because of situations like this. And we discussed it last night in our open. Um, that you know, I understand that it happened during COVID, and it was something that they did to kind of limit the amount of travel people were having to deal with, but for situations exactly like what Sacramento is dealing with. When you face a team, especially in your conference, um, that is a competitive team, it really matters. And you're playing without one of your best players that it really is, is not beneficial on the flip side. You know, it is from an experience perspective, as close to a playoff series as you can get, yeah. right? Back in two games against the same team, whether it's back to back or there's, you know, we play Houston. I believe Oklahoma City is the same thing. Minnesota, the same thing this year, where there's a day in between, but it's two back to back games um, against the same team. The, the, that is good, I guess, if you want to spin it that way for experience playing the same team. Um, consecutive games. But, you know, we don't play Denver until the very last game of the season. That's the next time wow. that the Kings face them on the road. I was looking at the schedule last night. I'm like, when do we face them again? We played them three times this year. And so we've got them twice last night and tonight, and then not again until the last game of the season. So, you know, it, that's kind of the, the strange thing about it in that perspective. But I, personally, I'm not a fan of it. But there are things that you can pull out of it that I guess you can look at as positive. And on the broadcast side, you understand, Jason, you, <laughs> you know, it's easier from a, you yeah. know, a prep perspective. So it might be a little bit easier for us, but it is, it adds a special challenge to the team. Yeah. All right. Well, Katie, thank you. So what's for breakfast, by the way, this morning? Oh, we're having a, a hash brown and a snowman waffle. So snowman it's, it's very, waffle. yeah, yeah, it's very uh, elaborate. Yeah, here. very festive. Yeah. We'll enjoy that. <laughs> we will see you at the uh, game tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. All right, fellas, have a good one. All right, thank you. That's uh, Katie Christensen, Kings television analyst. Yeah, the unique spot that the Kings and Nuggets are in, really, where they're playing each other. Uh, 24 hours later, Denver's the one that had the win. The Kings will be the team that has to adjust. And we'll see whether or not Sabonis gives it a go tonight. All right, it's that time. It is Wednesday. 